what I want to talk about today is um, some uh, research that we've been doing on a topic that I think is becoming really important uh, to all of us, and a topic that there has actually been very little research done on in any context. Primarily, if there's been any done, it's been done in the United States. So what I'm going to talk about is, um, I'm going to talk about the scoping review we did of all the literature in North America, Europe, etc. I'm going to talk about the secondary data analyses that we did of data that was given to us by um, CTV, believe it or not. Um, and I'm going to talk about a research agenda that I think we need to move on. I'm going to start out talking about Mr. Frank Piccolo. Mr. Piccolo um, is, or was, excuse me, Mr. Piccolo is dead. Mr. Piccolo uh, was a chemistry teacher. This, he's, uh, you can see pictures of him with his wife, Teresa. Um, Mr. Piccolo became very ill and was placed in a nursing home. And he lost some of his cognitive abilities, um, which was part of why he was housed. This is what happened to Mr. Piccolo in the nursing home. This was done by another resident in the home who took an activity board and beat him over the head, as you can see. The person who did this to him had been in his room already three times this particular day. The staff knew this person was in there, and uh, nothing much happened. So come on in. Come on in. <laughs> Lost. I know, it's an IQ test to find the institute. <laughs> <laughs> you, you didn't do too badly. Um, Mr. Piccolo uh, was obviously in the hospital for treatment for this beating. Um, he was sent right back to his old room. The person who did this to him lived right across the hall and continued to live in that room. And he died within a few days. So for me, because um, I met with his wife, Teresa Piccolo, I was actually, I'll be really honest, I was stunned at what I had seen. I have heard stories about this. You always hear stories about something somewhere. <laughs> Whether it's true or not, you don't know. Um, but with the photographs, meeting with her, and her struggle that she had with the, Fed, with the provincial government and Deb Matthews at the time, who was the minister, uh, nothing was done, nothing. She wrote letters, her daughter wrote letters. She tried to meet with uh, Deb Matthews. She couldn't meet with Deb Matthews. They brought in the police. The police, of course, said, there's nothing we can do. What could we possibly do? This person that's done it has some type of dementia as well. So, I mean, in, you know, that's the right decision as far as I'm concerned. You can't blame somebody who's carried out or perpetrated this murder, basically. It was murder um, when they don't know what they're doing. So she ended up going nowhere. And uh, what she did in the end, she did two things. She organized a walk at the legislature, and I went. Um, there was like maybe 30 people there. That's all there were, but it's a start. So I handed to her for that start that she did this, and she's been on the media quite a bit talking about it, which I think is also important. Um, and she pickets the particular nursing home about three times a week, and still does to this day. Um, so. I came, became very convinced that um, resident to resident abuse uh, was actually a very serious issue. Um, we do know that there is elder abuse within uh, nursing or long-term care facilities and, and retirement homes. Uh, we know more about, the, about uh, staff to resident abuse than we know about resident to resident abuse. And I'm gonna just talk a minute about the terms because people, as in every, this is a brand new field, there's been very little work done. People get very upset about the topics, or about how we define this. And um, 
one of the groups that are very unhappy about using the word abuse are the people in the field of dementia, which makes a lot of sense. Um, but in the beginning of talking about this problem, it was resident to resident abuse. Others use resident to resident mistreatment, which um, mistreatment usually covers neglect and abuse, both uh, areas. Some call it uh, resonant to resonant aggression or resonant to resonant re relational aggression. Um, some call it resonant to resonant violence. Many of the people, again, in the field of dementia do not like the term violence at all because it really, abuse, violence, some of those words are exactly correct. It's not like somebody purposely, calculatingly mistreating somebody. It's not. Um, and what, what more, uh, there's more of a movement uh, amongst um, the Alzheimer's Society and a number of practitioners to use the word responsive behaviors. And um, I, have, I will tell you what we did, and you can argue with me later. We had the first little national conference on resident to resident at that time abuse. And we went through um, a, a a day of def how we were going to use the term and we actually had a consensus procedure um, and then we went on to do another uh, a number of things about the research agenda that we needed to work on and so on and how we could work together and anyway the long and short of it is that we decided we were going to use the term resident to resident aggression not responsive behaviors because responsive behaviors cover a much broader area and it kind of uh, covers over that there is this problem. I mean, it can be any type of behavioral problem that people are going to be responsive to. And it isn't necessarily aggression. It can be a behavioral issue. Um, and what it's, pre I mean, it's a great premise. It's not been researched very much. People say it works. It's anecdotal evidence. We don't know for sure. But what it is, is that when somebody becomes aggressive um, or they have a behavioral issue, Re responsive behavior means that the person with them is trying to find out what is really the issue here. There's something else going on here and it's not nice. The person is unhappy, uncomfortable, in pain, whatever. And it's our job to find out what that is. It's the person is trying to tell you, so we need to figure it out. So anyway, our group, and we had about 50, uh, I think 54 people in our group, and we decided that through a consensus process that we would use the word aggression because we did not want to lose what was really going on. Because a lot of people would say response behavior, what's that? What does that mean? You know, it puts it on the professional. It's not about the situation, what happened. So there were a number of reasons why we did that. When we looked at the scoping review, a scoping review is one of many different types of uh, literature reviews of the research um, the uh, academics and institutes and so on do. And what you're only trying to do is figure out what are the trends? What's going on here? Um, what do we need in the future? What kind of research is actually being done? But really, what you're really looking for is what hasn't been done. What are, what are the gaps? What do we really need to do? So um, we, um, we did this scoping review um, and we worked with a librarian and a team of <clears throat> some of the experts from our uh, conference. And what we did is that we only looked at, uh, we looked at abstracts between 1985 and 2013, because we were doing it in 2014 and there wasn't much in 2014. <laughs> Just now. Um, and uh, abstracts with no uh, resonant to resonant aggression were removed uh, from <clears throat> our study. And what we did is we had two independent reviewers and they extracted the data and created the usual, but that's what you do. <laughs> anyway, 784 abstracts were identified. We were surprised we even found that many. This was in French and in English, um, but believe it or not, only 32, 32 out of 784 satisfied our inclusion criteria. Um, <clears throat> and six of them were found in what we call the Bray literature which is to say they were buried on a library shelf somewhere uh, that you would never have found unless you went to the library. And, um, which of course people don't want to do anymore. <laughs> only, there was only 14 
um, that exclusively focused on resident to resident aggression. Um, where were the studies? Primarily in the United States. 29 were in the US, two were in Canada, and one in the UK, and that's it, folks. Um, that, to me, was pretty stunning. There was a master's degree, a uh, master's thesis done at the University of Manitoba, which is actually one of the first studies done in the world. The student deserves a gold medal. Um, so anyway, um, the type of design we found, there, the, the design really matters when you're doing something as to how well you can actually have confidence in your results. And um, there were 10 re retrospective case records. So in other words, <coughs> people studied 10 records of uh, R to R aggression and it, after the fact when it happened and tried to identify risk factors and all the rest of it. There was one cross-sectional survey. There's been seven qualitative studies mainly done with um, staff, people on the front lines who have witnessed this type of abuse. There's um, a lot, there, six review commentary articles are all about this is really horrible. Hi, we really need to do something about this and we better do it now. There was one case control study and one randomized, one actual piece of real research. Um, anyway, this, this is the kinds of things that we looked at, how, what is the extent of resident to resident aggression, what's the setting, the timing, the types, the, who's, who initiates it, what, are the vic what do the victims look like, what are the triggers, um, and what are the responses to this problem. If you can find out the risk factors for this, you have a much better chance of actually intervening and doing something useful. Um, when we don't know what the triggers are, when we don't know actually how bad the problem is and where it is, like is it physical abuse, sexual abuse, what kind of abuse is it, we, we're not clear where we should intervene, right? And so, um, even though people go, oh, so boring to do prevalence, and so boring to do, but you know what? We need that information first. Then we can do our interventions. Then we can measure whether the interventions are any good. And uh, we're back at the beginning saying, gosh, we don't know much. Um, when we looked at the literature, the range of uh, reports was 16 to 62%, which is an enormous range which reflects different methodologies and problems. The most recent study done by Mark Lax, Pillamer, and a whole crew at Cornell University in the United States, they studied 1,902 older adults in 10 uh, nursing homes in their state on, on a random basis. And they come back and say the rate varies from 9.8% um, to I think 16% or, no, <laughs> excuse me, 9.8% to 31.2%. So, and when they say that range, they're saying it's because of different units. Like people are in different units. Some are in lockdown, mm -hmm. some are just in ordinary nursing home beds with maybe two or four to a room and so on. So that was the numbers they came up with. Um, so it depends on the source too. And one, this is a really important piece of information right here. Residents self-report rates as high as 60%. The residents, okay? And, and so it rate, the highest rate there, the, the resident would say, 60% of them would say this, and the lower end is 19%. Resident uh, reports um, a little, uh, higher than what the staff and family members do. And staff, for sure, the, re the report, the, their percentage can go down to 0.1%. In other words, it's in nobody's best interest, especially staff, to say that this is going on, because it's all about my job. Um, if you look at the types of abuse, um, there's uh, verbal, physical, psychological, sexual abuse, and of course, material abuse, stealing people's possessions. Um, the uh, setting and timing of resident-to-resident -resident aggression 
can occur anywhere, as everybody knows. But when we look at studies, most of the few studies we have, um, the private room is, is the most common place um, where the abuse will happen. And that's what happened, for example, to Mr. Piccolo. It was in his room. It wasn't out in the hall. I mean, you saw probably, I'm not sure which television station in Edmonton, very recently, the resident came right into the room, pulled the woman out of her bed by her hair and dragged her into the hall. Um, again, you know, anecdotal, anecdotal for sure, uh, but there you have it, it was in the room. Um, the uh, hallways, dining hall, main lounges, less and less, not, not as much does it occur in that particular area. Um, in terms of timing, some of the studies suggest afternoon and evenings um, to be the more common times uh, that this type of abuse occurs. Um, the victim, in an ish if you look at the initiator uh, characteristics, uh, they tend to be male, they tend to be of the strong personality type, um, they tend to have a short fuse, no patience, uh, they have a life history with a bit of violence in it or aggression, um, and they actually are a little cognitively more with it. Um, they certainly have a lack of empathy. The Pillamer uh, lack study found some very interesting things um, about the, the initiator of the event. And what they found, this is not up here, this, because this study just came out. Uh, it's not even out. I, I just know this because I know them. Um, what they found was that the initiator was depressed because they, they had done measurements of depression during that. Anyway, they measured depression and they had severe behavior problems. That were two of the outstanding features of the people who were doing um, the aggression to other residents. The uh, other interesting thing was that comparing the 10 institutions that they had looked at, one of the um, important issues that they found was that the ratio of staff to residents was much lower where the aggression occurred. Number one, and number two, they found that crowding was an important factor in the, in the, in the nursing home. So um, there's, a, there's a whole cluster of factors that support the initiator's um, behavior. The other thing that they, they found actually, which is more than the other studies that say strong personality, um, they, they found that the people who were the initiators did have some form of dementia, but they were not as cognitively uh, challenged as the victims. So they were a little more with it. And that one, I, you know, is, it's been found in a qualitative study earlier. This one was a really serious um, uh, statistical, you know, good measurement study, and uh, I was surprised to see that. So there may be some cognition involved that the person does have an awareness that they might be doing something. Um, in terms of the victim, it's usually a female. The victim is usually very cognitively impaired, physically dependent. As you could see, I'm just using the example of the woman that was just on television. She was in, she was in wheelchair care. She couldn't get out of bed, she couldn't dress herself, and so on. Uh, Mr. Piccolo was in the same uh, situation. He too was totally wheelchair bound. He couldn't move, he couldn't dress himself, um, which makes it much easier for someone to come in and just bang, beat up the person. Um, usually as well, the, the older person who is attacked has a communication impairment so that they can't get help. I mean, you could hear the woman on the television show, help me, help me, no, I don't want to do this, but it's very quiet, you can barely hear it. It's not going to any stop, right? Um, the other problem that's common, which the wandering behavior of the victim sometimes gets them in the path of someone else um, that may be aggressive with them. 
Um, the triggers thus far that um, have been identified are, I would say almost, <laughs> I don't think they've been identified, but some of the, you know, like almost anything will set off an event. So um, if, if, if you look at the current research that we looked at, the physical environment has a lot to do with it. And I was just saying the crowding and, and the ratio of, of staff to patients are really important. And the qualitative studies found crowding, but they also found things like people fighting over TV channels, people fighting over room t temperatures. When, when people have to share rooms, right? Somebody has a TV blurring, somebody's trying to sleep. I mean, it's a nightmare. They're freezing and somebody's too hot. I mean, those are the kinds of triggers that may set this off. Um, in terms of the social environment, um, somebody may remind someone of someone else. I mean, there was just a, um, Mr. Furman, I don't know if anybody noticed, Mr. Furman was also killed by someone else in, Van in, in Vancouver, in BC. And um, he, he was killed by somebody in the armed forces because he, he was from the armed forces himself and it reminded people. Oh, you're great, thank you. Lunch. Um, the, socially, the person who is, who is being attacked maybe uh, remind the person doing the attacking of some other situation that they were involved in. So the McLean's Magazine was trying to make an argument. There's no evidence for this. They were trying to make an argument that it was soldier to soldier, and that's what the problem was. Um, the other problem is that there's a lot of communication barriers between residents. Um, in other words, they can't communicate. Um, agitation uh, is one of the problems, and I know everybody's seen the agitation of someone sitting there, and pretty soon it drives somebody else crazy and they attack. Um, there's uh, loud outbursts from from other residents who yell and swear and so on, which they can't help, but it happens. And that may set someone off as well. I don't know about the exclusionary social cliques. We found that. If that were the case, the, the, the initiator would be very positively <laughs> with it, right? <clears throat> In terms of staff and resident responses, the resident tries to call for help. That's the first uh, order of the day. They don't usually get any help because nobody can hear them. Handling the situation alone to the best of their ability and the other factor that has been noted is obviously avoiding the aggressive resident, which is really hard to do when they're in your own room or when they're across the hall. Um, the staff try to verbally intervene. Um, in Ontario, I believe, I have, somebody can correct me here, but I believe the uh, app, the Long-Term Care Act, says that you can't really touch and, whip and hold people because it's a form of restraint. So it becomes very difficult for staff to deal with the issue because they can't just get in there and say, all right, enough. Um, they can say, all right, enough, but <laughs> they can't get into the middle of it. Um, so they may separate people uh, it is in the United States, it may, this probably doesn't apply in many um, situations. Uh, I do know it applies in one of the maritime provinces because a, an aide phoned me and said that she'd been charged uh, or fired because of this, of not doing anything. And the problem was, she said, I'm not allowed to touch anybody, so how am I supposed to do anything? And I thought, well, that's a really good point. Um, a lot of staff watch and do nothing because they might get in trouble. Um, one of the really interesting things is that, that the victim who, is, who has um, suffered the attack is more likely to be neglected by staff. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. Um, it's just like Mr. Piccolo. He was totally ignored. Like, never happened right up to the administrator of, of the nursing home. Don't, no, nothing. Forget it. Don't even want to talk about it. Um, most of the injuries that older uh, people experience as a result of being um, uh, attacked is to the upper head face, their upper extremities, because normally they're maybe in a wheelchair or they're in bed, and so obviously that's what happens. 
The psychological impact is really uh, quite serious. Um, there is a lot of research on dementia and depression, and uh, it just escalates. Um, when it's sexual abuse, it's interesting where the police are called and not called, but when it's sexual abuse in the United States, um, the police are usually called. And um, Pamela Teaster in the U.S. has done a lot of research on this, and, um, and she says that's the first response of staff is to call the police, sexual abuse, this is terrible. Um, and the problem, of course, is you can't charge anyone, and the police rarely do. You have to wonder sometimes if the police are the answer to this. Um, I don't think they are. They are certainly the answer if a staff member is abusing somebody. They're certainly the answer if it's a family member, if it's a neighbor. Yeah, call the police. But in this instance, I think, I don't, this is opinion on my part because we don't know. It never seems to work according to Pamela Teaster. Um, only 10 to 11 percent of um, sexual abuse victims receive any type of physical or psychological treatment. It's very small. 15% of uh, victims, of sexual assault victims, um, and 15 to 30% of sexual assault perpetrators are relocated. Sexual abuse seems to be the only form of abuse that leads to relocation. In all the other types, verbal, physical, material, or, or financial abuse, or taking your possessions, or your food. Food is a big one that's taken. Um, there's no moving anybody. So if we put in all as RRA stuff together, um, it, it actually, the prevalence, I think, is, is a lot higher than we think it is. I think we've covered it up. I think it's higher than it is in the community. I think we're going to have a good, really good estimates on community abuse here very shortly. Um, and I'll be surprised to see if it's higher than what we found when we looked at the CTV data. Um, here's the thing that really is, I think, very upsetting. The people who, um, who live in uh, long-term care facilities and uh, who have been attacked in some way um, are really upset and concerned about their safety and their privacy. But they actually believe, and this is a result of a number of interviews, they actually believe that this type of aggression should be or is part of life. It's normal. It's not normal. But they have come to believe it's normal. That is terrible, in my opinion. And it's worrisome because that means they'll accept more of it. They'll accept it. And I think one of the, this points to, to me, strongly is that we need people to understand who are residents in these homes. This is their home. I wouldn't expect somebody to come next door and beat me up with a pot. I wouldn't expect it. And if it did, the police would be all over them in a nanosecond. This is not normal in our society. So the fact that they're thinking it's normal is really upsetting. We've got to do something about that. Um, we know some of the triggers that we've already talked about. Um, and we know who, who, it seems to, we seem to know who we're hitting. But we also are getting a, a slightly nuanced, finer view that the people that are initiating this actually do have some cognitive ability. Mm -hmm. But still, you know, it's not, it's not uh, worth it. Okay. Um, this, this was just a lucky break. <laughs> I don't know why, but um, there has been absolutely no prevalence data on this uh, issue collected in Canada. And our, the, the, the study I'm talking about of Wax and Pillar and everybody was just done like in November of last year. So there is no data. And their data is the only new data out there. Um, but we actually became very lucky uh, CTV <coughs> called me out of the blue. I mean, what do I do with CTV? Nothing. They called me out of the blue from W5 and said, you know what? Uh, we have a bunch of information and a bunch of data and we don't know what to do with it. Can you help us? And I said, of course. <laughs> right? <laughs> right away. 
Um, so what they did, uh, CTV had spent a year on this uh, and collected alleged and reported uh, cases of aggression in Canadian long-term care facilities for the year 2011. Um, they obtained uh, the information from a number of ministries across the country and uh, using public documents because in some jurisdictions they're public and others they're private. Where they were private they used the Freedom of Information Act for Canada to get the information that they required. Um, we analyze the data. You analyze some of the data. She helped us analyze the data. Um, <coughs> from the long-term care facilities, we had 67 regions uh, from across Canada. That um, There were, out of all of these regions, 23,521 cases of abuse. Of those, of those, uh, 6,494 were resident to resident aggression. So if you just calculate that out, it's pretty easy. Our finding, 28% uh, of people are experiencing this form of abuse. And when you look at the, the other part, it really makes you worry, like, that's a lot of people. Um, so we're in the ballpark compared to the Americans. If you look at this, what the 67, we, the 67 jurisdictions were covered out of 88. That's 76%. We, this, is, this is not bad. 76% is a fairly decent number of the 88 regions that we looked at. And you can see, you know, some weren't um, as forthcoming. Quebec, Saskatchewan, we missed some. Um, Alberta, not one. <laughs> um, the cases that uh, we saw or examined um, of the 28%, physical abuse was the most common, which is a totally the opposite of what goes on in the community. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's totally the opposite. In the community, um, the physical abuse is the smallest proportion of abuse that happens from 1990. We'll know again in, in five months how bad it really is now. Uh, physical and verbal abuse together was 19%. We couldn't, you know, in some cases the data was very messy. It was very messy. Everybody has different reporting systems and on and on. And on. Sexual abuse, 19%, and verbal abuse, 7%. Um, we're doing a national prevalence study right now of elder abuse in Canada, and we've done 2,000 cases thus far, a random stratified sample, and we're finding that verbal abuse is the worst thus far. We don't know. So it's quite different. I, I'd like to just address the one really good study that was done in, uh, <laughs> in Ontario, long-term care homes uh, over a 16-month period by Brazil who's now in another country, even though his name is Brazil, he's in Europe. Um, what they did is they studied 339 individuals that were admitted to three long-term care facilities in Ontario. Uh, three months post-admission, 23%, 23% already, of the residents were involved in a documented resident-to-resident -resident, uh, aggressive event. Um, with physical injury or psychological injury. Um, the people who were in, involved, the, the initiator, again, had a, had a diagnosis of dementia um, and had much more serious behavioral issues um, at the time that they went in and three months later. Um, so this is, uh, this, is, this is a starter for us in Canada saying, you know what, you know what, maybe if we go back and look at these 339 people, we can start to look at what were the triggers. And one of the, one of the issues that I probably shouldn't say, because again, this is anecdotal evidence. I've heard from a number of professionals and I've heard from a number of older adults and their families that if anywhere on a piece of paper 
in the process of going into long-term care, if there's the word aggression, behavior symptom, um, your chances of getting in are much slower. So we have not documented that, we, do, we have not researched that, we don't know if that's all anecdotal evidence, but it's much easier not to let the person in at the front end because then you won't have the trouble. So um, that is a really serious issue because where do these people go? Where do they go? Um, okay. Anyway, this is all the same old stuff. Um, we, it, what, what, are, what we should say is that the CTV data is problematic data because of the different ways of collection by the staff, the different forms that are used for reporting, and the fact that some is private and some is public. There's many issues. We, did our, we found the most commonalities that we could find across the whole range of everything. So this is not the best data out there, okay? We uh, need to do a better job of collecting data. Um, so the summary is there's not a lot of literature. Uh, as far as we know now in Canada, 28% seems to be the number. Um, physical abuse is the most common. Um, we, we already know there's been at least five deaths in the last year as a result <coughs> of this particular type of aggression. Um, dementia is definitely part of the problem on both sides of the equation that we have to remember that, which means that we can't use police and law and to deal with the issue. We need a better way to deal with the issue. Um, we have very few intervention studies. They did one, this, the Carl Pilfer famous study that's just about to be repeat, or to be published. Um, they ran a random clinical trial on um, a type of in, in for intervention called search, which I'm not entirely, it's not entirely clear what search is, but it sounded like a little a bit of responsive behavior to me. Um, and they found that there was only a 10%, there was no significant difference between the control group and um, the intervention group. But what it did do as far, their calculations were that it reduced it meant that 10 people less were abused in a nursing facility as a result of this intervention. So it's not a great intervention, but it, it's made a uh, dent. We have um, a number of different formats of responsive behavior teams in this province is that uh, you can have a responsive behavior team come to your home, you can have the team go to stay in the nursing home and work with staff. Um, but we don't have any real data. I mean, you know, people say, oh, it's way better. Some people tell me, no, it doesn't work at all. Once the team's gone, there's nothing happens. Um, we need to research that. We haven't researched that. So if we're going to talk about um, research, this is the whole business about the conference. We did a, well, you don't want all those boards, but, um, you can see where resident to resident aggression was the term that people chose. Um, we looked at whether we should be looking at triggers, staff education and intervention. It's where people thought these were our priorities were. Um, I don't want to go through all this. We got the definition. Anyway, what we decided is that we needed to work on intervention. We needed a prevalence incidence study so that we know what we're dealing with uh, to find out what the problem is. And we need to do uh, more around identifying basically risk characteristics um, to find out what can we do to stop this because it is, this should not happen in someone's home. So um, anyway, there's Teresa Pickening. And I look at you, they <laughs> say, we've got to do something, all of us. That's it. Done. For research. We had a slew of comments while you were presenting. I didn't know if you wanted me to break yeah, I in. I bet they're outrageous. <laughs> no. <laughs> There's over 50 people online. Oh. Um, and what did they say? 
and I just wanted to give you some gist of what, what's um, gone on. Um, so, uh, one person wanted to comment that staff can be, staff can physically hold, or like, in other words, touch the resident in those cases where there's violence going on. Uh, they're allowed Depends to what, prevent harm. What, what place, what province? Uh, Jane, uh, can you tell me what province you're from? from? I'm, I'm guessing Jane Needus. Oh, Jane. Oh, oh good. Lawyer. Okay, there we go. That's right here. I guess in, in circumstances in Ontario. Of, of what? This is important information. Okay, she said that um, staff can physically hold, separate in an emergency. In an emergency. Okay. If they are assaulting or going to assault, it's the ongoing detention restraint that there are others. Oh, sorry. I just oh. If it's long-term. If it's long-term restraint, they can't do that. Okay. The, and uh, they can absolutely touch in these situations. Um, sorry, it keeps bumping every time someone makes a comment. Well, it's okay. Thank you, Jane. Yes. <laughs> Everybody saw that. And she that, said, right? when you asked where, she said any place. Okay. Well, uh, another person, uh, Tammy, says that in Durham region, they have had a number of residents charged with physical assault and sexual assault. Um, another person, Robin, says that police are called constantly to these facilities for all cases, not just sexual. And another, uh, Cindy is saying that we are obliged to report all instances of resident-to-resident -resident abuse to police and if there is injury, also to the ministry as a critical incident. We have a form that is completed around RRA without injury that is uploaded to the police department. Um, Can anybody tell us if the police do anything? Well, he, one of the guys mentioned, or Tammy, I think, mentioned that they actually have residents who are all, who are charged. Yeah, I know. And then what? Oh, so good Tammy question. Tammy Rankin works with um, uh, John Keaton. Yeah. And so the two of them would go together. But I represent the Central West area, and I can say that working with Peel Police, Halton Police, by the time they actually arrive there, the, if the resident has dementia, they don't remember mm -hmm. what they have done. And so it's hard for them to actually charge them or apprehend them under the Mental Health Act because the person doesn't remember what they've done exactly. and they don't have criminal intent, right? Mm -hmm. So you're right, in these cases, police are called and it's not really helping the victim or the, the perpetrator in these cases. Mm -hmm. And really, it's up to the, to the staff because under the Long-Term Care Homes Act, they have a duty to protect, they have a duty to create a proper care plan and review the care plan. And so if you know that you have a resident coming in with responsive behaviors, then you need to look at, you know, calling in the psychogeriatric resource consultant, calling in the Behavioral Supports Ontario team to try to reduce the risk of that resident harming other residents. So it's it I always put the onus back on onto, <coughs> you know, the staff, you know, and they are understaffed. You know, you're right in, in regards to, you know, CCC coordinators doing the long-term care assessment. If I know that that client has a responsive behavior, it's going to be really hard for a long-term care home to accept them because they can turn around and they can actually deny them from coming in saying that we don't have the appropriate resources to provide the care that this person needs. And there's not enough beds for behavioral units. You know, if you look at St. Peter's, you look at A1, you look at Sheridan Villa, these people are waiting. And I used to actually work for the Alzheimer's Society for seven years. I had one client who was in the community, had a prior history of domestic violence, assaults, um, you know, mental health as well as substance misuse. These people are aging. He had many incidences with the police a lot of court diversion, and he ended up assaulting his wife. He was on parole, has dementia, and ended up at Maplehurst Jail, only to then be transferred to the psych ward of the hospital to be assessed, because the care coordinator couldn't go into the jail, to assess him for long-term care, placed him into long-term care. This person is at a high risk of harming others, and he ended up dying the next day. But it was such a sad story, and the reason why I share it is because you're right, Like, but we don't have anywhere to put these people. Do they belong in jail? No. Do they belong you know, in a facility where other people are at risk? No. 
you know, but there's not enough behavioral units and there's not enough staff to intervene. You know, part of the problem too, just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we'll get back. You no, know, part of it, you know what, like blaming, I don't like blaming the staff. I do not like blaming the staff because they didn't set this particular facility up. They are no. not the board of directors. They are not the CEO. No. They are not running the chain that runs this, if it's a chain, some of them aren't, of course. Yeah. So who, who, where does the responsibility really fall? And I think it falls at the top, not the bottom. Yeah, yeah. We That's just my staff. own view. Yeah. We need more staff. Just perhaps on the, on the same point, the, you mentioned that the staff to patient ratio was one of the risk factors. Yeah. Um, if, if, if people aren't familiar with the Long Term Care Homes Act and the regulations, there's just a myriad of rules. Uh, everything from you know, toenail clipping to brushing your teeth at the mm -hmm. point yeah, of there's care, no there's, rule there's, stuff. There's, uh, there's a bill of rights. Um, but one of the criticisms of our Ontario Long Term Care Homes Act is, is that we don't regulate the staff to patient ratio mm -hmm. and we don't regulate the care hours. And that's different from, say, Alberta and Saskatchewan who have taken that step. They've taken so that may be one of the, one yeah. of the big issues. It's a huge issue. And I know CARP is pushing for it because they did a study and they found only two hours of actual contact per resident per day. And they were pushing for, because in the Long-Term Care Homes Act, it's supposed to be four hours, but it's not actually It's happened. not four hours. It's not four There's hours. been an, a couple of Canadian studies that have shown very clearly that does not happen. Mm -hmm. And there are also ways of manipulating staff ratios, using holidays and leave and all kinds of other ways that goes on that nobody talks about. Did anybody want to, does it, corrections, that's what I'm looking for, which is helpful, just so we all know. Um, I was just trying to find, someone did comment on a place, T. Roy Adams Center, Regional Center or something, I'm, I just have to find it again in the myriad of text here, um, sure where they thought was a, oh, <laughs> T. Roy Adams Regional Center is a, a, an excellent place for violent, people that are violent. Uh, so there was a, a mention of a place. Um, sorry, every time, I, I just keep Older people, home. younger people. Both. I'm assuming older, but let me just go back to where you said that. Um, well, I will tell you some other things people are saying to you okay. then while I look for it. While we're at it. Yes. Um, so uh, someone also thought that the police need more training because they're getting a lot of cases where they're uh, called for people with dementia. So training about dealing with people with dementia. Well, should they even be called might be the first question. And uh, another um, person says, Tammy, regardless of cognitive function, it's the function of the court to determine not crimin criminally responsible findings, so like whether or not they're criminally responsible. Um, Francis says, better environmental design, smaller scale, more home-like environments have been shown to reduce use of meds, yeah. behaviors, and uh, whatever else it was before. Well, that's good. That's true. Yeah, yeah. And um, sorry, someone else said that uh, agreed about the police. John Keating says police absolutely need more training. Um, and Jane is letting us know, know that T. Roy Adams, the regional it, place that we mentioned, is a specialized unit like at Sheridan, Baycrest, and Cummer. They are not permanent. They are a long-term care home, but people get admitted there from other homes, community, and stay until their behavior is managed. So that's another I wonder if it is. Issue. There, are, there are many different There's lots of those kinds of units. That's yeah. where a lot of this happens. Yeah. And apparently it's a regional center for dementia. Yeah. Okay. I found what you were saying very interesting. I haven't studied it, but I have studied violence directed against staff in long-term care. Ah. And a uh, couple things. One, the staff ratio is obviously very important. Related to that is that the autonomy accorded the staff. If they are told they have to do this and then this and then this in a certain order, and they don't have the chance to spend more time with this person, less with that, that's a big problem. Uh, the third one that has been mentioned briefly is, is this, the size of the unit. 
certainly what we have found looking in Europe in particular is that the smaller sized units are much less prone to aggression than the larger units. <coughs> the final thing I'd say has to do with, with risk management or risk assessment. I was uh, a few months ago in um, a home in Germany, a mentioned unit. Uh, first thing I saw was one of the residents with a sharp knife. Why? Because she was cutting the onions. She was involved in helping make the meal and was, and in fact, consulting with her fellow residents, some of whom responded about how thick or thin the slices should be. So if you have that very, it, it has the ironic effect, paradoxical effect, that to, to pay less attention to risk and more attention to living actually reduces risk as well as the mother living. So, uh, the I, I think that you're, that's the whole stream of, through the humanities and the arts that we're looking at right now in the intergenerational schools where people with dementia are involved as equal partners in you know, in doing life. art and doing everything, but it's not actually moved, I don't think, too quickly yet into the well, larger And, and the, the cases that you cite, especially the murders, have just the opposite effect. What yeah. it means is there could be even more of your regulation, not fewer. That's what's good, that's what uh, may So when, when we compared uh, three Ontario provinces to several European countries, Scandinavian Nordic countries, I should say, uh, the incidence of violence directed against staff was about seven times as much in Canada as it was in the Nordic countries. Uh, daily or almost daily, a little under 7% in the Nordic countries, around 42 in Canada. Yeah. Uh, this is daily or almost daily. It's an understatement because the European survey asked about uh, verbal and perceived, and the Canadian did not. So it's, you're right about the under reporting underestimation for sure. Yeah. But it seems to me that you're also right about the need to focus on things structural, not on the behavior of individual staff. The only staff thing that came out of our work was that there should be more training given the changed population uh, in right. the homes from 20 years ago. Of course, all the workers came 15, 20, 25 years ago. And you know, the training isn't just about abuse or neglect. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a broader training in the field of gerontology and geriatrics to right. understand the whole difference that older people represent and the complexity of their care, which, mm -hmm. you know, I can't say it's a big uh, item on the educational bill in this country. It's not. Yes, sir. Training. I want to share a uh, sort of one thing uh, about the training. But I don't think that's the training. Is how to stop the passion about looking after the senior. What do they love to do? Or do they do that? The example we had a uh, nursing training that didn't used to be classified as being out to do a uh, geriatric or um, our stuff is on it. And we do, do see that way they come. So we sort of remove it and start the way. And one thing we told all the staff to do is when you see these things come, talk to her and tell her what you love. Mm -hmm. People online are having trouble they hearing, hear you. hearing comments, so I was wondering if um, you could summarize it or, or speak louder. I, I feel oftentimes you go back to the human nature. If people know that their people could be one of the trigger, just nobody likes to talk to me. We just wanted to aggressively capture the attention that I need somebody to talk to me. And that could be a trigger. And But no one knows that it actually is a trigger. She used the different behavior. Sometimes could be aggressive behavior. But just say, come to me. So if you see that coming, so I think the staff to to patient with the resident ratio is important, but I think it is more important is how many times you touch that, the human touch that seat. You don't need much time. You could have one great staff looking after the whole floor if that's a great caregiver. 
stop by for two seconds, talk to that lady, and two seconds to that lady, and you're okay, are you okay, are you okay, are you okay? That each fountain is a personal touch. And it's the personal touch that counts, not necessarily the, the ratio. Ratio can increase, but I think it's a, more the human to human touch. Yeah. We can't count a lot of human to human touch, though, if you don't have some people there to look <laughs> after. <laughs> and I mean, that. I think that really is a serious point both ways. I can um, just reinforce what was just said about the personal touch. David Sheard in Britain uh, says he hires people for the institute or the, the institutions that are part of his network. It's about 50 or 60 homes in Britain now. That the first thing they look for is the right kind of person. They say, we can always train with you. And they do a lot of training. But the first thing is to get the right kind of person doing the work, which yeah. is the case in almost all of the workers here as well as there. Absolutely. But, uh, if and we, we don't always get the right type of person. Yeah. That's your point is administrator's job. It's not the people who work there. It's That's the higher. point. That's my point. I think it's, a, as you say, it's a structural issue that begins at the very top, or at the very top of a chain. Um, and uh, the struggle is profit in many instances and non-profit. That's the struggle is every time I add more staff, more training, more this, more that, it costs more money, right? It's a problem. Anything more? Lots more. I'm having trouble oh. keeping up with it. <laughs> 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 and then every time I try and focus on one, better technology. someone adds another thing and I have to look for Go it again. So um, I try, but then they, yeah. they keep adding. Well, Jane and Medis have certainly me. clarified for us and I, Yes. Appreciate that. And she had also said that police do charge and the people end up in jail, but the courts don't know what to do with them. Um, I to judges, I can tell yes. you they don't know what to do with them. Yes, and um, there was something else. Uh, okay, never mind that. Let me keep going here. Jane also mentioned resources are not reasons to refuse residents in long term care. CCACs, families, etc., should uh, challenge. You know, that's an important faster. point while you're looking, what Jane is saying, I think all of us need to challenge more. And I think we need to help families challenge more as our job mm -hmm. because that's where it's going to start. It's going to start on the ground and it's going to be not, you know, we have to start not accepting everything that's handed to us. Like some, Jane will agree, like some hospitals say, oh, if you stay an extra day, you're, ex you're going to pay $1,000 a day every day. You're going to say, that's a, not the law. But they get away with it because people don't know. They don't know. We need to educate them. And secondly, some people are always afraid to say anything because, oh, it might harm the older person. And so we have to be vigilant, all of us. And uh, it needs to start on the ground, I think. So Jane's right. 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 Uh, someone else asked if you could put the summary slide back up. Oh, OK. <laughs> Just backspace. <laughs> yeah, I know. And. Um, Angela said, I often wonder if the residence bill of rights can be used in order to enforce basic human rights that basic human rights are adhered to. Uh, for instance, safety and security of the person as a basic human right from the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Um, and well, the, the WHO is also trying to set mm -hmm. um, a hum human rights legislation for the world for right. older people. Under Susan, right. Lynn, will this slide stay there? Will this slide stay there? Uh, sure, if, if it's okay with you. Sure. Uh, you can I mean, this is just rough stuff. We're, we're nowhere, I mean, we have lots of anecdotal evidence, but we, this is the best we have right now. People are saying thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're done. Thank you thank very you. much. Okay, so I'll put the, this up. Where, where are we putting it? Um, people can email the institute, aging at utoronto.ca, and uh, make a request for the slides, and we'll send them out. Okay.